2019, the Lord spoke unto me almost audibly. I was at my desk. And it's as though someone walked into the office and I heard the voice of God say to me, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call you upon him while he is near. Then he said, and you shall seek me and you shall find me when you have searched for me with all of your heart. Preach from this subject today, our theme, which is a command. Upper room, this is a command that God is giving us for 2019. Those who are watching, those who are streaming, we welcome you. Thank you for joining us. You've joined us some time ago and you've heard some good preaching already. The Lord is commanding all of us to seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Say it with me and use your command voice. Say it authoritatively. Seek the Lord. Yeah, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Look at the person to the right of you and tell them, seek the Lord. The person to the left of you, tell them, seek the Lord. Amen. Seek the Lord. Most, most may have God took your husband home. Well, preacher, what do you have to say to me? Seek the Lord. Seek him. He'll see you through. Bless us now, Lord. May we preach that which becometh sound doctrine and gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. Some wonderful things have been said about our text. About Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1 through 6. Just let the people come in. And uh, before we go any further, I want to deal with what the prophet was saying to his audience and what God has to say to us tonight. One of the wonderful things prophetess and evangelist, prophetess Callaway, evangelist Cleveland, that is said about Isaiah chapter 55 is that it is the fulfillment of Isaiah chapters 1 through 54. And that chapter 55 lays the foundation for chapters 56 through 66. So in theological circles, Isaiah chapter 55 is the pinnacle of the book of Isaiah. 1 through 54, chapters 1 through 54, points to chapter 55. And the remaining chapters, 56 through 66, point back to chapter 55. In chapter 49 and verse 6, God confirms something that is very important for us. He confirms that his servant, um, was not to bring salvation to Israel only. As a matter of fact, he called, he said to his servant, his servant being our Lord, that it is a small, it's too small a role for you to bring salvation to the Jews only. Your role is to bring salvation to the whole world. Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 6 says, And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be, that thou shouldest be my servant 
to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. That is, it's a light thing. It's too small a role for you. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation to the ends of the earth. That is, I don't want you to bring a salvation that's to the Jews only. But I want you to be the light to the whole world. Now the problem with what God wanted for his servant was that it was an assignment that was one that caused the Jews to struggle. It would not be easy for the Hebrew people to invite foreigners nor Gentiles to join them because as God's chosen people, they had developed a distinctive identity. Amen. See, to be a Jew, it was as much a part of ethnicity as it was a part of their faith. See, the Jews... When you talked about the Jews and Judaism, it referred both uh, to uh, their race and their religion. So they mingled it together. Um, to be a Jew meant uh, it reflected their religion as much as their ethnicity. So when your whole identity is tied up in a particular religion, then it's difficult to invite people who are not a part of that identity to be a part of your religion. It's like uh, those five percenters and there are certain uh, uh, black folk who believe that they are the lost tribe of Israel and that the Israeli, that they are the true Israelites and, that, and they, they argue that the true Israelites were black. So... Um, there's no room in their thinking for whites to come and join because it interferes with, with, uh, with many of them in their theology. Israel had made this same error. I'm headed somewhere, and I want you to, I want you to hear me tonight. Um, now, to add insult to injury, God himself had commanded them to keep their ethnic origins and for them to keep their religion pure. So intermarrying and idolatry were contaminants that had to be avoided at all costs. So the Jew was supposed to remain a Jew. And Judaism as a religion was not to be mixed with any other religion. All right? So now, they had mixed their ethnicity with their religion. They had been commanded of God to keep their religion pure and to keep their ethnicity pure. But it wasn't uh, a form of racism on God's part. And it was not separatism on God's part, but purity was required for God to be able to use them. It was the will of God for the Lord to take the Jew through Judaism and win the rest of the world to himself. Are you with me? They could have sinned at any extreme. An attempt to reach out, they could have gone too far and become worldly. On the other hand, an attempt to be pure, they could have become exclusive instead of inclusive. They could have run people away instead of bringing people in. You know what they did? They fell on both accounts. They became too worldly. They did intermarry. They mixed idolatry with their Judaism and they excluded other people. Yes, so by the time Jesus walked the earth, 
Israel sinned by assuming that they were exclusively chosen by God for salvation and created a religious system based on regulations rather than faith. And uh, it, was a, it was a system that was not effective in reaching people. But our text makes it clear to whom God was reaching out. When you read Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 1, the first thing the prophet does is he uses an intention-getting device. He says, oh! It's almost like when we preach and we go, oh! It's to call, bring you in. Sometimes we hoop to wake you up. You can change it now. You can, put some, you can circulate it now. Because, you know, sometimes people say, I don't like all that holler, but they sleep until you holler. And the Lord is coming. Yes, sir. Glory. So Isaiah uses an intention, an attention getting uh, a device. He says, oh, and, and, and that, was a, uh, that was a tone of pity to it because he really wanted the people to listen. And notice who he's calling. Isaiah is not calling out to the Jew. Isaiah is calling for everyone. Notice where it says, oh, everyone. Praise the Lord. This is good news because the God of the Bible is for everyone. I often say that Jesus is for every man. This is why it doesn't work to be a believer and also to pledge and join uh, groups that, are, that exclude people. That have secret handshakes, secret stances, praise the Lord, a secret book, and they worship in a secret lodge, you see, uh, but they claim to have in their heart Jesus who is for every man. So when you get saved, my brothers and sisters out there, and you're into the secret stuff. Praise the Lord. Whether uh, it's uh, in uh, life or in college. My amen's got smaller than you. Now don't come talking about my pledge. Whether in life or in college. When you come to Jesus, Jesus calls you out. Because Jesus Christ is for every man. And it is quite contradictory to be filled with the one who's for every man, but you pledge to a group that excludes most people. He says, uh, oh, everyone... Everyone, see, God's ultimate purpose is to bring all races, bring all races, ages, genders, and ethnic origins, bring people from all of these, from every corner of the earth, to bring them together in one spiritual body under the banner of the cross, and they're all living saved. When you come to the Lord, you got to change. Do you know that's why the world, Hollywood, has such a problem with Christianity? Hollywood loves Buddhism. Hollywood loves these side religions. I, they're not even real. Hollywood loves them because the problem Hollywood has with Christianity is, is that Jesus controls you. See, when you get saved, you, you, you have to change. And uh, you have to come out. You can't be saved and shack up. You can't be saved and be immoral. Amen. You can't be saved and be a fornicator, an adulterer, a homosexual, a lesbian, a drug dealer. When you get saved, Jesus cleans up your language. When you get saved, you can't be an actor. 
praise the Lord. And uh, on one commercial, you 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 are uh, uh, hawking beer, and then uh, you go to another place and you're telling young people to pray. That's inconsistent. When you get saved, praise the Lord. Salvation changes you, and in some ways, salvation limits you. But in limiting you, it sets you free. But freedom in Christ is not freedom to do what you want. It's freedom to be whom the Lord made you to be. See, we're free to live holy and free to enjoy him and free to be clean. And all oh, the world uh, doesn't like that. And so what the world tries to do is they either try to bring up and honor and respect other religions or they try to change Christianity. Notice the respect. Have you noticed in movies the respect that they give to Islam? Yes, the respect that they give to monks and to Buddhists and all the Hollywood's love affair with yoga. Yes. And, and, uh, and if they have a, a iman on a movie, you notice the dignity that he's portrayed with, let them have a preacher on the show. The preacher is the killer. Uh, the, the save uh, Mormon is deranged. In all of Stephen King's movies, the Christian is the devil. In one movie, the wolf man, the wolf man in the city who was killing everybody was the pastor. I said, I said Lord. <laughs> I mean, it's, in, in the movie Carrie, the girl that, that gets crazy, her mother uh, just quotes scriptures out of context, and she's as mean as she can be with a cross on. Uh, what was that movie? Uh, the guy, uh, um, well, I think it was, uh, I can't think of his name right now, uh, but uh, the crazy lady got him. He, he was driving a car. Misery. Oh, Misery. And you remember, this is not a part of my text. I'm going to get back on. But, oh, that lady was crazy. But, in, but did you notice, as in, when you watch a movie, everything is placed. Did you, did you notice in misery how if nothing sparkles and shines as that woman is saying crazy stuff, the cross does. That's because most of these people who make movies and things like that, they're enemies of the cross. It is not by mistake that in just about every major Hollywood production, Jesus is cursed at least four to five times. In the movie, the actor is going to swear by saying Jesus Christ. Using his name. They're not calling on him. They're using his name as a swear word. And the Bible says, thou shalt not take the Lord thy God name in vain. The name Jesus should never be loosely used. You should never say to someone, my Jesus is good to see you. For the name Jesus is not to be used as an expression. There is not salvation in any other name. It should be used consciously and always with reverence. Hollywood does a good job in its attempt to make it common. The world is angry with biblical Christianity. And yet it is God's will. And, and by the way, the reason why they're so angry with, with Christianity is that it's the only true religion. See, um, uh, according to the Psalms, according to the Psalms, the gods behind all other religions are devils. They're demon spirits. Different religions are not equal but separate paths to the same God. There's only one path to the true and living God. See, the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran can't be the same God. Because Allah uh, has no son. But Jehovah, Yahweh, the God of the Bible, has a son. And his name is Jesus. So they can't be the same God. It can't be the same path 
a separate path. That's called postmodernism. All religions, separate paths to the same God. Jesus excluded all other so-called paths. I got to get back on point. But Jesus says, I am the way. He used a definite article. The way. The truth. And the life. And then he said something. He said, no man cometh to the Father but by me and Muhammad and Buddha. No, but by me. Only through Jesus can one be saved and, and get to heaven. Matter of fact, Jesus even addressed all so-called messiahs who showed up before him. John's Gospel, chapter 10. He says, I am the door to the sheepfold. And uh, all who came before me claiming to be the door. He said they were all thieves and robbers. That's what they were, thieves and robbers. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is the only savior. And it is the will of Jesus. It is the will of the God of the Bible that all people be gathered through God using his servants that all people come to know him. Jesus is for every man. And yet, after saying that Isaiah is calling for to every man, even though salvation may be available to everyone, and this offer is available to everyone, it is not, however, obtainable by everyone. It's available tonight, but it's not obtainable because the only ones who can obtain this are those who are thirsty. Let me tell you something. Yes, Biblical Christianity is not for the passive. No. It's for the desperate. Yes. If you don't want to be saved, oh, that's right. if you really don't want this, if you don't want this more than you want anything else on earth, you won't make it in this. Well, you know, I'm saved, but I'm not sure whether or not I want to stay with the Lord. I'm looking at the, 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 the walking dead. It's just a matter of time that you will, unless, unless you develop a hunger and a thirst for the things of God, you won't stay saved. See, let me tell you something. He's worth thirsting for. He's, this thing is worth having. And, and, and each person has to, has to see the value of it for themselves. Isaiah said, let everyone that thirsts, Psalms 42 and, and, and verse 1, uh, I, I love the, the, the 42nd Psalm. Uh, actually, I think, turn to it right quick. Psalms 42, I want to show you something. Um, David says something awesome. He says, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul. 42 in verse 1, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Praise the Lord. As the heart, as the deer craves water in a dry place. And, and it is said that the scent of water to a thirsting deer is so powerful that that deer may leap across the road. He may actually leap into an 18-wheeler and lose his life being driven by its desire to obtain that water. It is a craving. It is a powerful urge. David says, as the heart. Long for and as the heart's a uh, heart rate speed up, as it panteth after the water brooks, 
so panteth my soul after thee. Let me tell you something. In this Laodicean age, you don't find many people craving the God of the Bible. As a matter of fact, we're all too laid back. This, this is one of the problems with the church becoming incre increasingly casual, increasingly sec uh, secular, increasingly singing all these sad songs, increasingly uh, laid back. It is we, we're losing our yearning and our craving for the things of God. And the God of the Bible says, you got to want me. You've got to crave me. Some people, when they read Psalms 42, they hear the voice of David wandering in exile, uh, running from his son uh, uh, Absalom. Others recognize that it is the Messiah doing when he was rejected and suffering. Some detect the plaintive song of the Jewish remnant during the tribulation period. Others, when they look at Psalms 42 and verse 1, uh, uh, they apply it to believers as they look back on the days of his first love and long to be renewed to the Lord. Fortunately, it is not necessary to isolate any of these views since, you know, that's the versatility of the Psalms. It can be applied to all of them. Praise the Lord. The prophet in Isaiah chapter 55, he was using uh, the illustration of a Near Eastern water vendor. Now, water vendors were a big part of the Near East. And, and, and if you go places now, if you go to Disney World and different places like that, you see people who are stationed in certain places selling water, especially during the summer. There are water vendors. Well, in the Near East, uh, there were water vendors and the Near East, Mesopotamia, uh, Iraq, uh, Turkey, Iran, uh, Syria, places like that. The, it was nothing for the water vendor to come to town and announce to the people that he has water for sale. They had no running water. Uh, amen. There, there was no speakets that, that, that bringing water into the house. And so... The water vending was a good, was a, was a, was a, you could earn a good living selling water. You could, if you could find a good fresh water supply and find a way to collect that water and go into a hot desert town saying, water, water for sale. Oh, come everybody who's thirsty and buy some water. Oh, you're the man at that point. And, uh, and so he uses the illustration of a water vendor. So the water vendor comes to town selling water. And, and what the vendor really does is he gives them a sale uh, of sales. You're talking about slashing the price of the water. He says, everybody that's thirsty uh, come and, uh, and, and even if you have no money, oh, I'm going to look, you're going to buy this water because it won't even cost you anything. So, well, I, there's no point in me going out there because I have no money. He says, no, 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 you don't need money. Come if you have, come without money, come without price. Come and buy, come and get this water. Isn't that something to think about? Amen. Uh, and, and so he's selling water. And this water that Isaiah is selling, he's using the illustration of a water vendor. But the water uh, it represents the blessings of Christ and the blessings of God that the Lord has for the people. It's salvation and his blessings. And he moved from Simply selling them water, as you see in verse 1, he says, come ye, buy and eat, come ye, buy. He, he goes from offering water to moving it up a little bit, and he offers them wine. And he offers milk. And he says, even with the wine and the milk, you can have it without money, and you can have it without price. The wine and the milk uh, stands for some of the even greater blessings that the Lord has 
for his people. And it is a type for a banquet. So now God is offering them a banquet. God is offering them water. God is offering them wine. God is offering them milk. And he says the only thing you have to have to buy the, to get these things is you don't need money. You just got to thirst for it. You got to want it. Everybody shout, want it. Want it. Uh, Brother John, they, 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 they are, they are the, the, uh, for those who are visiting, Upper room has a signal that they send me. They start fanning hard when they're getting hot. So cool it down just a little bit. Praise the Lord. I don't want nobody to pass out. You know, I remember coming up in the church. Holiness churches didn't have air conditions. We, we, we didn't have anything. And just sit up there in the summer and burn up. And just, and just and it was all right. But I guess we got used to. And I don't want you to think we didn't pay the water, the, air, the, the bill. So we're going to. Going to help you out. But he says here, says, come and get this. I have something for you, and you can come and get it, and you can buy without money and without price. And then he does something that I think is powerful. In verse 2, he says, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? You know what the question there is? Why are you spending your time? Spending the majority of your time and your energy and your effort for that which is not the bread of life. You're buying bread, but you're not buying true bread. Think of the energy that we invest in things that will not satisfy us. See, what he's alluding to is that they were trying to settle down in Babylonia. This chapter is to the exiles in Babylon. They're trying to make it in Babylon, and they begin to spend all of their time trying to settle in Babylon. So, and, and, and while trying to settle and find their lives in Babylon, they begin to neglect the Lord. Think of the things that we get involved in that causes us to neglect the Lord. Oh, it's popular now. People say, folk, we don't have all day to go to church. And people will tell you, Christian people, people have other things to do. The truth is now, most people don't have time for church. Most people don't take the time to seek the Lord because we're busy doing other things. We have kids. There is school. There is work. There's achievement, there's this, there's that, and there's, there's so, there is, uh, there's our beats, and there's music, and there, there are so many things that keep us from the Bible, that keep us from praying, that keep us from entering into his presence. But here's the thing about all those things. None of those things ultimately satisfy. We're, we're chasing things. We're chasing things that will not fulfill us. There's a God-shaped vacuum in every man. And people today, even believers, have been pulled off course. Many preachers today, no wonder they have no word from the Lord. They, they watch the, the Word Network to find out uh, what other preachers are preaching, and the, the minister don't know that his, his members watch the same channel. So they're trying to say whatever the TV preacher said the last time, acting like they got a revelation. But many times these guys can't hear from God because they ride around all day on the phone. They don't spend the necessary time that it takes to hear from the Lord. So when you don't hear from him and you're distracted and you're doing so many other things. And listen, many of these things aren't sinful things in and of themselves. They're not wicked things, but they, they steal your time. The devil has figured out how to keep you from really seeking the Lord at night. He raised up Jimmy Kimmel. And all of the rest of the nighttime comedians and as and, and soon as that show go off, another show come on. And as soon as that one go off, another show come on. So by the time you fall out, uh, you haven't spent any time before the Lord and you used to wake up early enough to do your morning devotions. But since you've been up so late, you don't have time to do that now. So you barely get to work 
on time and by the time you get off from work you're so tired or you have another job and so all of your time is being stolen and the God of the Bible is standing there saying what about me let that sink in for a minute now I'm going to pray for everybody here who stays to be prayed for. But I want you to hear this because I'm giving you a strategy to defeat the devil. The truth is we're too busy. It's a trick of Satan. And the thing about it, for all of this activity, we're getting nowhere fast. I was reading something the other day. For all of the diets, all of the plans that are out there today, for all of the uh, weight loss things, I mean, every other, other commercial is about losing weight. We have more obese people. These things aren't moving the needle because they do not satisfy overall because people are trying to do things without the Lord. Most of the time when they're trying to raise money for cancer and trying to raise money for disease and they, so they have a march, they march on Sunday. They march on the Lord's Day. You can't hardly get to church because they have a bicycle race. And all this on the Lord's Day. Well, we can't do it on Monday because people have to work on Monday. All right, well, we have to worship on Sunday. The Lord. The devil is, listen, listen, he, he's, he's stealing your time and he's giving us false priorities. Yes. Well, Pastor, I, I, I'll eventually get back to the Bible. I've, I've seen the, I've seen the, listen, uh, baby section, parents, I've seen the pattern. When the kids are small and they're coming up, the parents will tell me, Pastor, I can't get to church on Thursday nights for Bible study like I used to because the kids have to go to school in the morning. Like in holiness, kids hadn't always had to go to school in the morning. So I'm going to, I can't get there because the children have to go to school. So I notice, I notice, now the kids are in high school. And they still can't get to church on Thursday night because the kids have homework and they got to get to school the next morning. Bam, I pray one Sunday for all the kids who are going to college. Lay hands on them. Now they're off to college. Guess what? Thursday night, those parents still don't come to church. They got in a rut. They got in a funk. They got caught up in a weight. Bible says lay aside every weight and the sin. A weight because you shifted your priorities. Uh, was that AAU? Worst thing ever. They have them ball games on Sundays. And parents, Christian parents, uh, it's a good thing that I'm one of the kind of preachers who really don't care whether you say amen or not. Uh, Christian parents have their kids out there on the Lord's Day shooting the basketball, chasing the football, playing soccer at, at 11 o'clock on Sunday. So why would you do that? Well, my child got to make it to the NBA. Look, you better make sure your child make it to heaven. Heaven. You want to teach them a healthy respect for worship. Well, what if they get mad? Let them. What if they stick out their lips? You do what the, my, my mama did. I stuck out my lips. She slapped me in the mouth. Lip came back in. I learned how to do that. But now we're, we're weak and we don't get that it's a trick of the devil. So he asks here, he says, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which which satisfieth not. I've never seen so many unsatisfied people. I've never seen so many unhappy people. Famous, but unhappy. Rich and still miserable. 
praise the Lord, poor and unhappy. Just unhappy. The, 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 the style now is to be unhappy. Praise the Lord. But that's because people aren't spending time before the Lord. They're spending their money and they're buying bread for things that ultimately will not satisfy. The Lord gives, the Lord gives the antidote to satisfaction. He says, here's how you get satisfied. Verse 2, he says, hearken diligently unto me. And eat that which is good. And let your soul delight in fatness. He says, listen to me. Matter of fact, if you read verse, from verse 2 through verse 3, you see where he says, hearken. Listen to me. Three times. Which is, which is a sense of urgency. The Lord is saying to all of us, listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. I'm saying something to you. Listen to me. Listen to me. Don't revolt me in your mind. Don't sit there with a spirit of strife and debate and argue with me. Don't sit there smiling, going point, counterpoint. Yeah, I hear what you say, but we got, no, no, no. Listen. Listen. Don't fight it. God says, listen to me. He says, here's how you get blessed. He says, hearken diligently unto me. And Eat ye that which is good. What's good? What I'm going to tell you. What I'm telling you. And your soul shall delight itself in fatness. Fatness means spiritual blessings. Fatness stands for abundance and riches and food and fare. Fatness literally means the best that God has to offer. He says, listen to me and I'll change your trajectory. I'll change your life. I'll give you joy. I'll satisfy you. I'll bless you. Praise the Lord. But you got to listen to Don't fight me. Don't go online and see what you can find to rebuke what the preacher is saying. No, God says, listen to me. And I will give you fatness. I'm telling you that in 2019, God has fatness for the seeker. Praise the Lord. He says in verse 2, hearken diligently. He says in verse 3, incline your ear. He says in verse 3, hear. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. And he says, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. During David's reign, Israel's kingdom reached its greatest extent. David was a worshiper of the Lord. And therefore a witness to God's truth to all the people of his empire. And he was their leader. Psalms 89 verse 3 through 4 and verse 28 and 29 says, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Verse 28, my mercy will I keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. Verse 29, his seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. God promised mercy. God promised grace. The sure mercies of David are the mercies of God that you can count on no matter what. The, the sure mercies of David is that God promised David that there would be a kingly reign in his family line forever. During the Babylonian captivity, the Davidic line of the kings ruling in Jerusalem came to an end with Zedekiah. However, in the New Testament, that unconditional promise that God made David was uh, fulfilled in Christ. Hence, when Jesus came, they called him the son of David. And he, his kingdom has been reigning ever since. In verse 4 through 5, oh, that's a, that's a powerful promise there. God says, behold, I, I give him for a witness to the people and for a leader and a commander to the people behold thou shalt 
Call a nation that thou knowest not. Grab hold to this. And nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee uh, because of the Lord thy God, for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. God says to Israel, nations that you don't know anything about are going to run to you. They're going to want to be like you because I have glorified you. Let me tell you something, saints. In 2019, God wants, it is the will of God that he make every one of us attractive to the world where people who we don't know right now will come to Jesus based on what they see in us. People that we don't know will run to us because the Lord hath glorified us. God knows how to make you attractive. Don't listen to the world. Don't pick up the world's vernacular. Don't try to talk like them. Don't let the world cause you to become pessimistic like them. Keep your Christian optimism. Keep your hope and people will see the light of Jesus on your life. Because there's a glorification that God has for everyone here. And when I pray for you tonight, among the things that I'm going to ask God to do is that I'm going to ask the God of the Bible to glorify you. Then he says this, and I'm wrapping it up now. He says, seek ye the Lord. While he may be found, call ye upon him while he's near. This is both a promise and a warning. Praise the Lord. This is the promise of 2019. Actually, in this particular verse, there is a reprieve. A reprieve is a postponement of punishment. It is judgment put off. God says, I, I have a way to keep judgment from coming to you. Seek me. But, but the time, listen now, the time is limited. It is, you don't have forever. Hear me now. The, you know, the devil will tell you, oh, don't listen to Wooden. You have plenty of time. No, you do not. If you're going to get what God has for you, you got to know that this offer, this free offer of water is an offer with an expiration date. It is not forever. People will tell you as long as the blood is running warm in your veins, it's never too late. That is not true. The train can leave the station and never come back your way again. You have to seek the Lord while he may be found. And I'm here to tell you tonight, he's, he can be found. He wouldn't make the offer tonight. He wouldn't tell me to preach it tonight. Brother, y'all look at me now. Wouldn't tell, tell you to preach it tonight if it wasn't an offer that is good. God says tonight, I can be found. I'm not hiding from you. But it also implies there will come a time when the God of the Bible cannot be found. Oh, Job went through it. Job said, oh, that I might find him. Have you ever gone through a stage where you just seemed like you couldn't find God? Well, I'm telling you tonight, the Lord says, seek me while I may be found and, and call upon me while I am near. A person must repent, praise the Lord, before God withdraws his presence and begin his judgment. There is a sense of urgency in our text. In 2019, he says, call on me. And I'm here to tell you tonight that the glory of God is in this place. He says, seek me. To seek the Lord. Uh, if you were in prayer, you heard me. That to seek the Lord means to inquire of the Lord. Part of seeking him means to inquire of him. To inquire of God is to study God. To inquire of the Lord is to learn about God. Lord, I want to know your thoughts. Lord, I want to know how you feel. Lord, I want to know what your position is on this, that, and third. How do you find out? Number one is you read the word of God. Seek the Lord while he may be found and call ye upon him while he is near. To, to seek him 
is to inquire, and, and uh, not only is it to inquire, but it is, it is to inquire, but it's also to require. Good God Almighty, to require. God, I need your help. Do I have anybody here tonight who will say to the Lord, I need your help. I require your assistance. I want you to know the God of the Bible wants you to call on him. You want to honor God? Call him. David said, I love the Lord. He heard my cry. Amen. And heard the voice of my supplication. He says, therefore will I call upon him for as long as I live. It is the will of God, Brother Sawyer, that in 2019 we call him. We require, we seek him, and we inquire, we want to know him, and we're calling on him. This word carries the general idea of seeking lost property, such as an ox or a cattle. If somebody loses their lost property, God knows how. You know what happened when you lose something that's dear to you? You drop everything else until you find what you have lost. You drop everything. Baby, you, you, I, I was a little late getting here tonight because I left something to turn around and go back and get it. Well, some of us have lost something. You've lost that closeness with the Lord. Praise the Lord. How, how is she doing? Amen. We don't want too many. Is she all right? What's wrong with her? I told him to turn the air on. God touch her right now in the name of Jesus. I don't, right now, just bless her, Lord. Bless her, bless her, bless her, bless her. Somebody point and say, bless, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Good God Almighty. And God's going to do just that. Uh-huh. It is to, I got to find what I've lost. I've got to get my relationship back with God. Some of us was close to him, but you don't feel him now like you used to. Good God Almighty, but he knows how to bless your soul. Good God Almighty, he knows how to pick you up and to raise you up. And then, but you got to want to find what you've lost. I wouldn't be satisfied. I wouldn't let the devil keep me home from church. I wouldn't let him rob me of my praise. I wouldn't let him keep me from getting back into that place that I used to be in in God because I want what the Lord has for me and I want the Lord. So therefore, I've got to seek him. Seek him calls for a radical rearrangement of one's priorities. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to have to cut the television off. We're going to have to have a few more fast days. We're going to have to stop being a social butterfly. Got to get off social media. Cut out all of that texting and all that stuff and spend time before the Lord. Asking God to give you that anointing back. Asking the Lord to raise you up and give you the strength that you need to be that child that the Lord is calling for. Somebody lift your hands and say, yes, Lord. I want to know tonight, is there anybody here who's willing to make a radical change? A radical change in your schedule. A radical change in your behavior. A radical change for what? To get to know the Lord better. To get your anointing back. If you're willing to make that radical change, start with giving the God of the Bible a radical praise right where you are. Yes! Hallelujah. To seek him while he may be found and call ye upon him while he's near. To call on him is to declare it is to invite, it is to invoke. How many want his presence? How many want his anointing? I want it, I got to have it. And in 2019, the good news is, if you seek God, you'll find him. And if you call him, he'll answer you. Because the Lord is near. He's near to heal, he's near to deliver. Good God Almighty, give God a hand praise because she's walking out. Y'all give her some water, give her some hydration, and she's gonna be fine. But lift your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. 
because he's a healer he's a way maker he's a miracle worker the Lord is in this place and he knows how to bring you out on time I wonder how many tonight will declare that 2019 is my year 2019 is my time what is it my time to do it's my time to get in his presence it's my time to get to know him like i used to know him it's my time to get to know him like i've never known him before it means that i may have to be a recluse it may mean that i can't hang out all the time it may mean that i gotta steal away but how many know he's worth it he's worth the trouble he's worth it and anointing is worth it power is worth it healing is worth it somebody say yeah yes he's worth it give him praise in this place right now I want you to look at that person next to you and say seek him seek the Lord seek him and you'll find him and when you find him guess what everybody's gonna know that you found him because when you find God you find his favor when you find God you find his power when you find the Lord you find power to go through death you find power to go through hard times you find power to endure sickness and to come out with victory on the other side you find what you need to be able to defeat the devil can i get a witness and there's only one response there's one correct response to give god when the lord said seek me and you'll find me when you've searched for me with all your heart the correct response is found in psalms 27 and verse 8 it says when thou saidest seek ye my face my heart said thy face O lord will i seek can i get somebody in here to throw up their hands and said thy face thy face will i seek i'll seek you lord i'll take the invitation i'll take the deal i want my water i want my water i want my healing i want my deliverance i'm gonna seek him for what he has for me somebody say yeah say yeah yeah Woo! upper room praise him in here praise him all over and uh we'll know around the first quarter who's seeking him we'll see it because it's going to change the church. It's going to change the church. Seekers and carnal people don't get along. They don't mix. Prayer warriors and prayer dodgers don't hang out. They don't mix. Mm -mm. Those who love the word versus those who love idle gossip. Don't get along. Hallelujah. I said years ago that there, I prophesied that there is coming a divide in the body of Christ. And the divide will be, God bless you, Sister April. Praise the Lord. I didn't see you up there. Uh, that was her daddy that went to heaven. Praise the Lord. And your granddaddy, baby. Pray. Uh, see, I, I like to point out people who come to church in situations like that because you know sometimes we lose a loved one and it's a month 
before we see you again. But the best thing you can do is get back in the service. There ain't no deliverance home. There's no power sobbing. You got to know how to get right back in the race and, and let the Lord bless you. As we move forward, we will see who's seeking the Lord and who's not. It's going to be interesting at the prayer, at the time when I give my call for those who will come together to shut in, to seek the Lord of the leaders who will come. Of the congregation, who will find the invitation to seek the Lord as a attractable, an attractive invitation? Praise the Lord. So what we're having? We're gonna pray. Glory. We're gonna pray. We're gonna pray. Who, who, who's leading the song tonight? We may not sing. Will the church house band be that? We may not need any music. And then how many musicians will show up when they're not playing? I'm talking about seeking the Lord. How many choir members will show and they're not singing? God, we're coming to get in his presence. And to rejoice. To weep. To be revived. To empty out. And then who is going to help you empty out? Will you join me in emptying? Or will you fight my emptying effort? Oh, come every man that is thirsty come without money come without price come get this water Drink it freely. If I be a man of God, I heard something that Evangelist Cleveland said the other day that I like. He says, I don't carry the tag of prophet, but there are times that the Lord moves on me to prophesy. I prophesy when the Lord leads me. I will say this. In the days to come, in the 2019, those who take advantage of God's offer and who are intentional. See, prophetess, you were, you were, you were, you were in the right place you tell them whether or not they say amen. I don't worry about that. You're in the right place. Because God's calling us to the cellar. Yeah. See, yeah. when she was preaching, I said, you know what? She's dead on it. Yes, sir. See, that was too deep. You, you don't get much of a response when the message is that deep. Don't worry about the response. Because you can't even tell nobody going to the cellar. Expect me to get happy. They ain't going to get happy talking about going to no cellar. Yes, say amen. Amen. So well, next time, wherever you preach that one next, don't even, don't bother that. Because they ain't going to get happy. But I wasn't happy when my mama gave me castor oil. And by your response, you weren't either. But it got me well. When we go down to the cellar, when we go down on our knees and when we take God up on his offer, Oh, the benefits. Oh, the joy. Oh, the power that will, will, that will emanate. The favor that will come. 
And the greatest blessing will be, listen to this, simply knowing him better. See, because the Lord will never. I, I'll tell you this. I'll, I'll rephrase this. I was going to say the Lord will never give you anything better than himself. I want to rephrase that. That's too, that's too light. It is impossible for the Lord to give you anything greater than himself. But there is nothing that he has made that can compare to his anointing and his coming upon you and what he does in your heart and in your mind and in your spirit. And then as gravy, he begins then to give you fatness. The best. Fatness. Your lifestyle changes. Fatness. Because I know people who got the lifestyle, you know, they got the, got the things, but they ain't got the joy. See, the cars before the horse, they drive the nicest cars, but they're miserable. I mean, why, why you, why, how do you explain rich people on drugs? How are you going to have all the money and a drug problem? You think if you got all the money, you don't have a drug, you don't have a problem. Man. You got all the money, if that was the answer. And yet I know of Christians who have no money, but they don't desire drugs. Matter of fact, they'll tell you right fast, there is nothing more precious than Jesus to me. Let the earth and its richness be gone. I'm happy as can be with my Savior, Lord, I see. I am happy with Jesus alone. There is nothing as precious Jesus to me. Let the earth and its richness be gone. Oh, I'm happy as can be with my Savior, Lord, I see. I'm happy with Jesus alone. How many are happy with Jesus alone? Wave your hands if you're happy with him. And you got the joy of the Lord on the inside. How about over on this side of the church? One last time. There is nothing as precious as Jesus to me. Let the earth and its richness be gone. Oh, I'm happy as can be with my Savior, Lord, I see. I'm happy with Jesus alone. Happy, I'm happy just alone. Yes, I am. I'm happy with Jesus alone. Oh, Lord, happy as can be with my Savior. I'm happy with Jesus alone. Glory. Glory to God. 